Hello, um, my name is John Krakow. I'm a professor of neurology, neuroscience, and physical medicine and rehabilitation at Johns Hopkins. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about the science and practice of neuro recovery after stroke and why it's so hard. Um, for more information about what I'm going to be talking about, you can visit our website at Blam Lab, easy to find. And also, this is a book I wrote with my colleague Tom Carmichael. It came out in 2017, which goes into more detail about the neurobiology of recovery after stroke. Um, this is part one, where I'm going to talk a little bit about the hemiparasis phenotype, um, specifically of the upper arm and hand, um, and critical periods uh, for recovery. Now, it's been known for quite a long time uh, that stroke can cause two types of sign. Um, and they were talked about as negative and positive by Hewlings Jackson at the end of the 19th century. Um, and also referred to by FMRI Walsh, a neurologist at Queen Square in England in the middle of the 20th century. And the basic idea is that you can divide uh, the signs of hemiparasis into negative and positive um, components. Um, and one being what we all know of as weakness and loss of dexterity and control. Those are the negative symptoms. And then the positive ones are intrusive, unwanted components that interfere with motor control, like spasticity and synergies. Um, and really, it's important to appreciate these two components of hemiparasis because they have different effects on function for the patient, and they will probably uh, require different interventions because the mechanisms underlying them are likely different. So we'll talk about positive symptoms first. These are resting postural abnormalities and synergies, which are these unwanted co-contractions of muscles and joints during voluntary movement. Uh, we've all seen this phenotype of a patient after stroke, you can see them here with the depressed protracted shoulder, the arm is adducted and internally rotated, you've got flexion with the forearm and um, around the elbow, and then you have wrist and finger flexion. Now, again, this is an abnormality, whilst they're holding themselves at rest, they're not trying to move in this particular case. And then the um, analog of that during movement, are what we call synergies. Um, these were first really described over the natural history of recovery by Thomas Twitchell in this famous paper in 1951, where he basically tried to delineate the sequence of motor recovery um, in patients from initial plegia uh, through to normal movements. So here's this recovery sequence. You know, you can start off plegic, you could call that stage zero. Um, and now you have stage one where the shoulder is flexed. Stage two, you now have elbow flexion as well. So this is the flexor synergy, that when you try and move the arm, you get flexion around the shoulder and elbow. Um, and then it can proceed to being able to actually begin to move at the level of the wrist and fingers, but these are in flexion. So this is the full flexor synergy where you get flexion of the shoulder, flexion of the elbow, flexion of the wrist and flexion of the fingers. Um, you can then sort of see another synergy not always in this sequence, sometimes it can come first, which is the extensive sequence. And this is where instead of flexion, you get extension around the shoulder and elbow. Um, and if you're lucky as a patient, you can then begin to break out of these two types of synergy, the obligate flexor and the obligate extensor, and then begin to be able to move out of synergy. So for example, you might be able to um, flex the shoulder and extend the elbow. And then if you're really fortunate, the out of synergy movements can extend down to individuation of the fingers. Uh, so here you can see this sequence uh, going from plegia to flexor synergies to extensor synergies to out of synergy movements. Now we can switch to the negative system. So here you can think about this more as loss of motor control, and as I said, weakness. And one of the ways you can sort of look at people's motor control um, is in a setup like this, where you can basically have patients sitting at a table, they have um, their arm supported by the table, they have their arm in an air sled to remove friction, 
So this basically tries to isolate sort of precise coordinated dexterous movement of the arm whilst removing the effect of weakness with the support um, and also trying to reduce the intrusion of those positive symptoms because we know that weight support can actually reduce their presence so that you can look at arm dexterity in isolation. Now on the right, you can see the trajectories of reaching movements that a patient can make, uh, a healthy subject can make um, in this situation, um, because all of us will be able to make nice straight movements to all those targets arrayed in a circle like that. Um, and the movements would be straight, smooth, precise. Okay, and the nice thing about a setup like this is that there's only one way to make nice straight paths like that. Um, because your elbow and shoulder are level with each other. So there's a single mapping between the joint angles at the elbow and the shoulder and the Cartesian coordinates of the trajectory. Now, patients after stroke, despite having the weight support, despite having removal of friction, have great difficulty making such trajectories. You can see on the right that the trajectories are more curved, they're more variable, they're more um, imprecise. Um, and this is because it's very difficult after stroke to coordinate the elbow and shoulder in the precise manner required to make the straight trajectories you see on the left. And of course, the goal is, is to try and get from those trajectories on the right to those trajectories on the left. Now, if you try and look at the natural history of that um, recovery process over time, in other words, how much recovery do you get from those curved trajectories to the straight ones I showed you, you can actually quantify those trajectories, a measure that we call bias here on the y-axis, and you see time on the x-axis, and you can see that this bias goes down, means your trajectories are becoming straighter and more normal, and you can see that you get a nice reduction over the first four to five weeks, and then it just levels out, and you stop recovering. Um, this isn't some sort of insensitivity of the measure, because if you look all the way down here, you can see this dotted line here, which shows how sensitive this measure can be. This is the unaffected side here. So we could easily detect if they were to continue to improve, but they don't. So this is quite important to see that true recovery without the ability to compensate in terms of dexterity of reaching movements seems to mainly occur very early after the stroke. So what I've shown you then are the postural abnormalities at rest, um, the existence of synergies um, that basically lead to unwanted co-contraction um, across joints, the flexor synergy and the extensor synergy. And then when you remove those, you can actually show a negative symptom, which is this loss of dexterity, um, even when you've removed for a large part the effects of weakness and the effects of the positive symptoms, signs, I should say. Um, now you can go into more detail um, and look at these resting postural forces. Um, for example, you can have a subject be passively moved across a workspace with a robotic arm and then ask them to relax and then see if they have any unwanted remaining postural forces, even though they're trying to relax. And that's exactly what you see. So you can see here sort of um, heat maps of degrees of forces that are still remaining after the patient tries to relax. So you can see here that they're trying to just do nothing, and yet there's a flexor force pushing towards their body here on their arm. Um, you don't see it on the other side. And then if you give weight support, those postural forces are drastically reduced. This is what by Alcus had Joseph, a postdoc here at Hopkins. So you can see that weight support can alleviate the presence of these positive postural resting abnormalities. Um, now, what's interesting is that these resting abnormalities do not appear to correlate with what happens when you make voluntary movements. Uh, here you see on the y-axis, um, the, the resting postural force on the x-axis, what happens during movement, and you can see that they don't correlate. This is important because if you were to try and treat the abnormal, postural abnormality at rest, that doesn't mean you necessarily make them better during voluntary movement. This is very similar, for example, to, analogously to Parkinson's disease, that you, know, you can fix the resting tremor, uh, but that doesn't make some of the abnormalities in Parkinson's disease during movement any better. 
Um, similarly, weight support can remove the voluntary movement of the malady to flex a synergy. So here you can see um, areas that can be swept out by the arm with varying degrees of weight support. So you can see if there's no weight support, the patient can barely extend their elbow. They're trying to extend their elbow, but the flexor synergy prevents that from happening. But then as you increase the degree of weight support, they begin to extend their elbow better and better and break out of that flexor synergy. Okay, so here is the voluntary flexor analog of the postural abnormality I showed before, both alleviated by weight support. Now, we don't really know much about the biology of these positive and negative symptoms. Um, this is just um, very preliminary data that uh, are being generated in collaboration with Stuart Baker at the University of Newcastle in England, where we're beginning to try and develop a monkey model of synergies. Um, these were not seen in the classic pyramidal tract models of stroke in the mid 20th century. And so the idea was that perhaps we need to have concomitant cortical lesions to get a better sense of what's happening to generate synergies. And so here you can see a lesion over motor cortex. I won't go into any detail here, simply to say that we badly need a, an animal model. It's gonna to have to be a non-human primate model to investigate these positive symptoms. Um, that's because they are very important for human stroke, and yet we haven't seen them in mouse models nor in, as I said before, the classical non-human primate models. Um, and basically we're beginning to see evidence for the switching on of abnormal flexor EMG over time. This is what you can see here in red and blue, um, even though it's not so obviously apparent in the actual kinematics of the reaching of the animals. And we think this is because they are, are able to compensate with an alternative descending pathway, the rubrospinal tract, um, which we don't have as humans in anywhere near to the same degree. And so this is perhaps one reason why um, one hasn't really seen reports of synergies in monkey models, because there seems to be ways to deal with the abnormal activation of flexors. Now, the important point is that if you carefully look at these abnormalities, um, they don't always express themselves to the same degree in a given patient. So for example, here, you can see control subjects making those movements that I showed you at that table. Um, here are patients who are chronic, in other words, they're more than six months out after stroke. They have fugelmeyers of different levels. The fugelmeyer scale was devised to measure synergies um, of the twitchal kind. Uh, the higher the number, the better you are. So here you can see a fugelmeyer of 29. There are lots of curves and variability in the movements. Here they're straighter and more accurate with a fugal mile 58. If you compare these to patients who are acute, in other words, they are in the, within the first three months of stroke, or should we could call it subacute really, for the same positive symptom scores or even better in fact, their trajectories are much more variable. So here you can see that the positive symptom measure the fugal mile can be matched, as it were, or made similar in the chronic and acute states, but the actual dexterity, the negative symptoms are worse in the subacute stage than the chronic stage. That's interesting unto itself. Why should they be worse early than late? Um, and you can see that they are uncoupled from the positive symptoms or the fugal bile. This is just showing this in bar format, um, just showing that the fugal bile scores can be made the same matched as it you know in the acute and chronic and yet the kinematics are not the same they're much worse here in blue than they are in chronic so if you were to take a bird's eye view of all this you would see that um, the components of hemiparesis the motor control or the dexterity strengths the presence of synergies and of course compensatory strategies have been seen and investigated and attempts have been made to treat them in both human and animal models. So here, the ruler means measure, the tools mean fix. So in the rodent model, you can see abnormalities in motor control and strength, synergies are not seen, and there have been behavioral interventions that seem to be able to improve the motor control and improve strength. In the monkey, similarly, you can actually measure and train away motor control abnormalities and weakness. 
again, up until the model that I just showed you that we're building in the UK, there have not been synergies shown in a monkey model. In humans, you see all of these things, you see the negative symptoms, loss of motor control, loss of strength, presence of synergies or positive symptoms. Whether these can be treated is a big question mark. Okay, so in other words, whether it's negative symptoms or positive symptoms, whether those can be reversed in humans um, is an open question, which we'll talk about more, um, but, it, but we don't have a way to model as of yet the positive symptoms in animal models. Um, now I want to switch to making a case for why it's so important to go early by discussing critical periods. This is work um, done in a mouse model by Steve Zeiler, who is a stroke neurologist at Johns Hopkins that he did in collaboration with me and others. And what he wanted to demonstrate is that you can actually show um, that there is a window of opportunity for recovering control um, after a stroke in a mouse model. Um, here, we're just showing that you can actually investigate reaching in rodents, just like in humans. In other words, they can start by resting their paw like the human has their hand, they can lift, and then they can advance their hand or their paw. And this is called um, homology at the level of behavior. And a good case has been made. There is, in fact, homology for prehension in rodents and humans. Here you can see this rodent trying to reach out to pick up this pellet. Um, they prefer to use their mouth. So they have to be trained to pick their pellet up, and they can get better and better over time. Um, after training, um, you can actually give them a stroke. So this is a cross-section of the mouse brain. This is their motor cortex. You can make a uh, lesion that will actually cause a small cortical stroke. And here it is. This is the stroke in the motor cortex of the mouse. And then what you can do is you can see what happens after this stroke is induced, after you've trained the mouse to about 50% efficiency on lifting up pellets in that prehension task. Here you can see they get up to this level of about 10 days of training, given that stroke I just showed you. There's a plummeting in their performance as you'd expect. And then this is a week later. And after a week of having this deficit, you can start training them. And you see that even though you're training them every day for three weeks here, you can't actually return their level of performance to where they were before the stroke. Okay. But fascinatingly, if you don't wait these seven days, in other words, you, let's see if we started training without waiting. So let's do that. Over about a week of training, you can return them to the way they were before. So in other words, this is a very nice example of how if you wait a week and start training, you never return to the way they were before the stroke, but if you do it within 24 hours, you can actually get them back, okay? This is very important. This has been seen in other studies. It's been seen also in non-human primate models, which I'll show an example of in a minute. Um, and we have reason to believe this is also true in humans. In other words, that they will respond better at earlier periods after stroke than later to the same degree of training. Um, and if this is the case, then we both have to begin to give more earlier. Um, sort of as a biological proof, a sort of a scientific um, demonstration that there's something special about the milieu in the region of the stroke after, um, in the region around the stroke, you can basically do what we did before. You train the mouse you produce the motor cortical stroke, you wait a week before you start training, and as before, you can't get them back to where they were before. But now you do something unusual, you give them another stroke in the vicinity of the original one, the idea being that maybe a second stroke can reset the critical period, and then we'll start training right away instead of waiting a day, uh, waiting seven days, just a day, and you go back to normal. This is a very shocking result. So in other words, here was their original stroke, we couldn't get them better you actually give them another stroke, so they're in fact worse. But then because you resume training within a day versus waiting this original week, you can actually make them recover from their original stroke um, all the way back to the way they were before. Um, so this is a very, I think, compelling result because it suggests that there really is something um, special about the post-stroke milieu early. And this is to show that this is not just any strokes. In other words, if you give a second stroke, 
for example, in the contralateral motor cortex or in the occipital cortex, you don't in fact see this effect. So here you trained them, they got worse, you do the second stroke, nothing happens. Okay, so you have to have a stroke in the region of motor cortex, which is a, a region which actually has access to the spinal cord. And this is an involved slide, which I won't go into great detail. It is simply to show that a very similar result has been shown in the monkey. This is a study out of Japan. And basically, if you take um, a monkey and you train it after the stroke um, over a period of a month and a half, these are the days here, Pink is normal movement. You can see that as you train and train, you can get back to pink-like movements, which is a precision grip. Whereas if you don't train early, you end up with what's yellow, which is a compensatory get grip, and you never get back to the normal movement. All right, so train a lot early, you get return. Don't train, you lose it altogether. In fact, if you try and now train at this point onwards, you won't get back to the pink type of movements. In other words, it's a kind of classic case of use it or lose it. So if you take all these results um, in a book that I mentioned before, which I wrote with Tom Carmichael, we have an equation for what's going on. In other words, a real return to normal movements requires a high dose of training. It needs there to be some residual representation in the brain that controls the body part. And there needs to be a plasticity so that you can actually have increased responsiveness to training. So we know that this plasticity level is high early, as I've shown in both rodents and primates. Representation means that there's some area of the brain that can still access the spinal cord and behavior of the training itself. So if you go early, a given a dose of behavior, because the plasticity is higher, um, will have a bigger effect on recovery. And I would argue this heuristic um, equation can actually summarize the results um, across animal studies. This is part two. So here we're gonna say, all right, um, we know that there are components to hemiparesis, positive and negative. We seem to see that if you can train at high intensity, high dose early after stroke, you can actually have a chance of reversing the hemiparesis phenotype. Um, so how should we do that? How should we take these facts and apply them to humans? Well, one thing we've known for quite some time is that enriched playful environments promote recovery. So in other words, if you take mice and put them in a cage with friends, with ramps, with toys, with wheels, with places to explore like you see in A, um, you make them exercise like you see in B, and you give them training on particular prehension tasks like you see in C, and you basically put A, B, and C together. In other words, playful enrichment, exercise, and skill training, then you can actually get return. So the real question is, is, how do we do A, B, and C in a human? Um, before we get to how you do that in a human, we should dive a little deeper into this very interesting, long-known fact over the last 75 years, that if you create enjoyable, engaging, social environments, um, you can get all sorts of behavior-improving changes in the nervous system across scales. Right, so you can get changes in your own activity, gene expression, you get changes in cortical thickness and brain weight, all sorts of changes in dendritic morphology and spine formation, and improvements in learning and memory. In other words, this kind of environment in its totality has multi-scale effects. All right. So again, as I asked before, what would be the equivalent of this for humans? Well, The answer, for, as far as we were concerned, is to make patients make lots of exploratory movements in the space of everyday life and make it fun. So all of us in everyday life live in these clouds of movements. And this is a study done back in 2009 by Daniel Walker and his team. And they basically had people wear 
a kind of tracker and just wanted to see what you do most of the day with your upper limb. And what's interesting is you live in these kind of elliptical clouds of everyday life. And you can think about it, you know, when you're gesturing, uh, when you're driving, when you're using a knife and fork, this is the kind of world your arms and hands live in. So the clue to us was to sort of try and make patients do this, force them to make arm movements in this cloud of everyday life with the intuition that this would generalize to functional tasks. So as I said before, what would an enriched environment for patients look like? And how should we promote playful, non-task exploratory behavior in those statistical clouds of everyday upper limb use? Well, a clue um, for us was animation, that people love to watch bouncy, joyous, playful movement. That's the whole basis of Disney and Pixar movies. But we wanted to go one step further and have people star in such movies. So we basically said, we're gonna create a kind of video game an immersive video game that makes people enjoy moving their arms in those statistical clouds of everyday life. And the intuition was that you could give them weight support, but now you do it in 3D. Here we did it with an exoskeletal robot rather than a table, because we wanted it to be 3D. Remember, this is a way to sort of isolate the dexterity component. And the idea was that you would become a dolphin that would swim in the ocean and explore. And because you were exploring in this beautiful environment, you would not be aware that you're moving your arm all over that cloud that I showed you before. So this is a study that we did. And this is a pilot study with 21 participants. They had to be within six weeks of their stroke. They would then have to do three weeks um, of play, um, one hour in the morning, one hour in the afternoon, five days a week for those three weeks. And then in a control arm, we had it time matched to conventional upper limb therapy. In other words, they had to do one hour in the morning, one hour in the afternoon, time on task of therapy. And then they were followed up three days post intervention and at 13, 16, 90 days. And this paper was published this year. <clears throat> this just gives you an idea of what it looks like for the patients. So I think you can get the idea, you're basically exploring, you're the dolphin, you have to eat the fish. Um, this is a proprietary form of animation called neuroanimation um, that really makes you essentially jack your arm into the movements of the dolphin and it encourages a kind of playful, immersive exploration. Now, what did we find? Well, it was both positive and negative. So what we did find is that going early, either with the dolphin or with a time-matched regular therapy session, I this is a lot more than normal. In other words, an hour in the morning, an hour in the afternoon, uh, five days a week for three weeks. So this is orders of magnitude more than a regular session. Both those increased dose intensity sessions were better uh, than regular therapy. You can see this here in red is the two forms of intense therapy. Um, and then blue are various examples of regular therapy. So you can see that for the ARAT, a test of negative capability, in other words, a test of uh, strength and dexterity, the intense interventions, including the dolphin, are twice as good as normal. Um, interestingly, though, for the positive symptoms measured by the Fugelmeyer, which I mentioned before, we did not see, although since with a small end study, this could be a false negative result, we did not see an increased benefit above spontaneous recovery. Um, on the positive symptoms. So in other words, here you're beginning to see the puzzle of being able to perhaps liken the animal models, both in human in rodents and non-human primates, that just like in those studies, you can get benefit from going early in high intensity and high dose, 
but it may not be working as well for the positive symptoms signs, but we didn't know that because we didn't have a model of positive signs, um, either in the rodent or in the lung primate. So you can see the need both to reproduce this study in a higher end, a study ongoing right now in New Zealand to do that, and try to develop an animal model of the positive signs so we can see why they be, differ in their responsiveness to high intensity, high dose, non-task-based exploratory training. So to finish, why is restoration of motor control in the upper limb after stroke so hard? Well, there's a critical period that closes. Stroke in the human is a deficit disorder, the negative signs, and a movement disorder, the positive signs. And the synergies seem to be particularly recalcitrant and resistant to treatment. In chronic stroke, when the window is closed, it's unclear if training alone will ever lead to the kind of reversal that we can see early. Um, and it, you know, even though there's some evidence from some groups that a subset of chronic patients might respond like early patients, it's going to be important to get finer grain measures to really show that that is an improvement in dexterity. Which leads us to the conclusion that in chronic stroke, at least for the majority of chronic patients, we're going to need something in addition to behavioral intervention uh, to reverse the deficit, which may include, for example, uh, non-invasive or even invasive brain stimulation or some forms of drugs. I'll finish there. Um, these are all the people who have been involved in these studies, um, both in Switzerland with Andy Luft, uh, in New York with Jamal Pitago, Papa Selnick here in uh, Baltimore, and then Lauren Dietrichson in Canada, and then all the funders, including, of course, SKSI, um, and other collaborators on the right. Um, most importantly, I think, um, in order to produce a new form of immersive, playful gaming, you're going to need to have highly talented uh, programmers and artists. This is the core group, Omar Ahmad, Pramit Roy, and Jero Wimbledon, who were behind uh, the bandit, the dolphin experience. And I'll stop there.